Andrew Marshall. My name is Andrew Marshall. I'm the Vice President for Communications here. It's my pleasure to host this presentation on behalf of the Wilson Centre's Global Europe Programme. Christian Osterman, who many of you will know who directs the programme, is away, unfortunately. He regrets very much being unable to join us here today. Thank you for joining us for this discussion on why European human rights diplomacy matters with His Excellency Stavros Lambronides, European Union Special Representative for Human Rights. We're delighted to have him here with us today. Last year, we were honoured to have with us Baroness Ashton, who led a candid and fascinating discussion on issues that included North Korea, Iran, policies towards migrants, EU accession negotiations with the post-Yugoslav successor states, and I'm sure that some of those issues will recur again today. It's our privilege and pleasure to have Mr Lambronides here at the Centre. He is the EU's first special rep for human rights, an area that is of critical importance for the Union. He's no stranger here to the US. He holds a degree from Yale University's Law School and is a graduate of Amherst College. And he also worked in the private sector here at DC as an attorney at Wilmer Cutler and Pickering, a firm that many of you will know, a very distinguished outfit. Mr. Lambronides has previously served as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Greece and as head of the PASOK de delegation at the European Parliament before being elected Vice President of the European Parliament. His appointment as Special Rep in 2012 was a very strong signal of the EU's intention to give human rights a more central role in its external relations. Though the EU was established in the shadow of the Second World War, its foundations, as many of you will know, are in coal, steel and trade, and the original treaties make very few references to rights. And yet de democracy, the rule of law and human rights have been from the outset critical to the EU's aspirations and to its operations. As the EU has grown, expanded its ambitions and deepened political integration, the role of human rights has become increasingly explicit inside the EU and abroad. The Treaty of Lisbon in particular gave full legal effect to the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights and provided a way for the EU to streamline human rights into its foreign policy. These are big ambitions and also huge challenges for the EU to leave, live, live up to, and I'm sure that we'll hear more about those today. And now, without further ado, I turn the microphone over to our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here at the Wilson Centre, and uh, particularly so given the illustrious string of speakers that you've had in the past few years, including from the EU. Um, it's uh, my first official visit to the States. Uh, it's quite interesting, if you think about it. I've been to China, I've been to Egypt, I've been to Russia. Uh, I have traveled to a number of countries around the world that uh, uh, we uh, attempt to deal with uh, human rights challenges uh, together. In some cases, they are, they're quite dramatic. Uh, the U.S. trip is uh, quite different. We are uh, the European Union, the United States, uh, uh, countries, regions uh, that have uh, for a number of years, uh, for decades, uh, been what is called like-minded in many human rights issues. And uh, the effort that we have to make to ensure that uh, we keep that cooperation strong, um, which is not always as obvious as it might appear, it takes work, um, is something that I wanted to, uh, to work with and explore in my uh, contacts with the uh, state and defense and the White House and uh, and everyone else. But more than anything else, I, I was looking forward to the opportunity that we would have to, uh, uh, to meet today. It is a terribly difficult job to be doing human rights around the world. It is the kind of job that you have usually one step forward and two steps back. There are no easy wins. Um, from morning to night, you have crisis to deal with, and you lose the chance and the opportunity of perspective, standing back a little bit, looking at what you do, hearing uh, uh, you know, to other people's ideas. So what I'll try to do today is give you a brief outline of uh, what it is that Europe decided to do two years ago to create a new impetus of human rights uh, with it at, at the uh, forefront. Um, what are some of the main challenges that, uh, that I face, that we face in this effort, and that mainly the U.S. may face in this effort? And then I mostly look forward to the questions and answers. Uh, do human rights matter? Well, you know, um, there's so many people in the foreign policy establishments of Europe, uh, of uh, 
uh, of the United States and elsewhere that will, uh, you know, pay lip service to it, but basically think that it is a second-class sort of foreign policy priority, that it's soft foreign policy. In fact, I submit to you that there's not a single conflict in the world today where blood is being spilled, that if you look into it, you wouldn't find a violation of human rights as the, at the roots of the conflict or the resolution of a human rights violation at the roots of the potential solution to the conflict. Human rights is not soft policy. It's not, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a footnote uh, in what we otherwise do. Is human rights the only foreign policy interest of Europe, of the United States, of others? No. Uh, obviously, there are many foreign policy considerations and interests when we go and we deal bilaterally or multilaterally with countries. So it would be a mistake as well to pretend as if, given that human rights is so critically important for peace and stability and prosperity, that it is the only thing we look at. And in many cases, when I go to the challenges, you will see that conflict between different foreign policy interests rearing its ugly head in difficult countries and situations, and how we decide to deal with it, of course, as part of the difficulties of this job and of our job. Now, given that human rights is important, uh, it is quite interesting to notice what Europe did two years ago, back in July of 2012. It decided in the most uh, authoritative way to declare to itself primarily and to the rest of the world secondarily that human rights will be the silver thread, as Kathy Ashton, the EU uh, high representative, mentioned uh, at the time, of all a different foreign policy um, uh, work and, uh, and emphases. So whether it is international trade and the agreements we have with different countries or development, whether it is counter-terrorism or whether it is the environment, that in every one of these foreign policy topics, human rights will be mainstreamed as a main topic of concern and analysis as we develop these other policies. A strategic framework for human rights was created, agreed to by 27 at the time, 28 today, prime ministers and presidents of European countries. And if you were to read it, and I would encourage you to, I usually do not encourage people to read official documents. They tend to be, you know. This one is not bad. It's actually rather impressive. It has a very clear vision of where things are going and has a very strong commitment behind it. And it is one of those instances where the European Union speaking in one voice in fact reflects the, the highest common denominator as opposed to some lower one, as people are often, you know, uh, prone to accuse the EU of doing. Well, it's not the case. It's a very ambitious document. So how do we apply it? How do we actually make sure that human rights works and that we are um, a key player around the world in making it happen? My position was created, the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, at the time that the strategic framework was adopted. And the decision about this position is that it would attempt to ensure three things primarily. That the EU becomes more effective around the world when it promotes human rights. That the EU becomes more coherent when it promotes human rights around the world. And that the EU becomes more visible when it promotes human rights around the world. Effectiveness, coherence, visibility. Some of these goals have different audiences. The coherence goal, for example, and I'll say a few things about it in, in the end, is one that involves quite a bit our own house. And as I was talking to many in the U.S. administration this past two days, I tried to explore the challenges they may be facing in their own house in promoting human rights. It's not always the case that everyone doing different things actually does apply human rights in the policy that they do, even if a very ambitious document states that this must be the case. That is even a tougher challenge when you have 28 member states as opposed to just one, the US, one government. Where have I focused on in this past year and a few months as I've been trying to do this job? I have had to. Uh, this is a, uh, as you can imagine, every day your computer screen or your phone rings with a crisis. Um, there are over 190 countries around the world uh, with different human rights issues and challenges, possibilities for cooperation, in other cases the need to be very 
uh, vocal and critical of major human rights violations. Uh, the European Union does all this. We have 150 delegations on the ground in 150 countries. Our member states have delegations in virtually every country around the world. We deal with every one of these issues. But what is the compass that you set for yourself in this job to ensure that no matter what you have to deal with in an emergency, you still know where you're going? I will tell you very uh, briefly that the things that we have focused on in the EU the, the past year in terms of countries uh, that I have spent uh, most of my attention on is, first of all, countries that are major EU strategic partners. In other words, countries with which we have a number of contacts and relations that far exceed the human rights element, economic contacts, cultural contacts, other contacts. Major strategic partners are countries like Russia or China or South Africa or Mexico or other countries around the world. Second category of countries that I focused on are countries in transition in particularly sensitive areas around the world where the people in those countries are demanding more freedoms, where in some cases the governments of those countries are attempting to offer greater freedoms, but where the challenges are grave and where how a country tilts where it goes may largely determine not just its own faith, faith not just for the human rights, but even for its economic development and security, but also the fate of the region. One example is uh, Burma, Myanmar, in the ASEAN region. Another example is Bahrain in the Gulf region. Um, a third category of countries is countries in the European neighborhood. So countries where, by definition, Europe has a much closer cultural and economic set of ties, where what happens in those countries can most directly affect the European Union as well, and vice versa. In other words, countries in which we can actually have, and in many cases we do have, policies of interaction, including human rights, but a very volatile region, whether it is the southern Mediterranean and northern Africa, or whether it is the East, as you can see now. And finally, I focus on countries that may be part of the above categories or may not be, and these are countries that are particularly influential in multilateral fora at the United Nations, uh, in the African Union, in the inter-American uh, state system, etc., etc. In other words, countries that whose voice counts in a number of discussions that we have and give uh, um, to defend and promote human rights in those international organizations. These are countries. What kind of topics have I focused on and are we focusing on primarily these days? Well. Every topic in the book, as you can imagine, uh, it goes without saying. A fundamental issue for us is uh, gender equality and women's rights, and that goes throughout. And it's a very interesting debate because it's now coming up as well when the United Nations will be discussing its new Millennium Development Goals. Now, I apologize, by the way, uh, if I use terms that were probably even unknown to me a few years back. I don't expect every one of you to know what that means. And sometimes all this sounds too UN or Euro speak, you know, throwing out things that people don't know what that is and you sound smarter than they are. I don't intend to do that. But anyway, this is, th this is the effort of the United Nations, a collective effort of every country to set some goals for development, for eradicating poverty, uh, for uh, promoting a major need of the world today. And in 2015, we'll be devel developing those goals for the future. Uh, I just uh, uh, had a number of meetings uh, at the State Department discussing and coordinating on how we promote gender equality. Other topics that we're focusing primarily on these days are topics on which Europe has just published or is about to publish what we call human rights guidelines. What are these? These are specific instructions we give to our embassies on the ground and to every member state embassy on specific human rights topics, analyzing the potential violations of those rights in the topic and setting specific actions to take if a particular right is violated in a particular way. In other words, we have decided that in order to be effective in human rights, we cannot simply rely on saying the right things. We have to actually commit ourselves to specific actions. Even those of us who are so committed on the topic know that unless we do go through that 
difficult work. In the end of the day, we may not have the time, not have the focus, some, in some cases, perhaps not have the desire to do the right thing. Guidelines in the past uh, year and a half are on freedom of religion and belief, and think of how many fantastically important human rights issues and violations are based on people being discriminated against because of what they believe in or what they do not believe in. And we have many of those issues around the world. And think at the beginning when I told you how many bloody conflicts in the world today actually have human rights at the root of the creation or potentially resolving human rights at the root of their resolution. And think of how important dealing with freedom and religion and belief is. Um, freedom of expression, online and offline. Uh, guidelines that are coming out in, in a few months. Another major topic of our attention. Um, LGBTI rights, another third set of major guidelines around the world today, uh, and uh, a very popular set of guidelines that we just amended in the US at least, uh, anti-death penalty guidelines. Okay, so these are, if you like, major, major topics I've been working on. But again, every topic in the book, every issue in the book is one that I focus. Now let me try to go to what regardless of the country, regardless of the region, and regardless of the topic, are some fundamental challenges, umbrella challenges, as I call them, that we have to deal with and I have to deal with um, daily when dealing with human rights. First umbrella challenge is the attack on the universality of human rights. We see that attack unfolding uh, on virtually every topic by virtually any different number of countries and for different reasons. An attack against the fundamental architecture of human rights, which is that human rights are universal. In other words, we have all agreed a few decades ago that those rights do not depend on what religion I believe in, or what political system I support or live under, or what country I was born in, or what blood runs in my veins, or whether I'm a man or a woman. The universality of human rights is finding itself under attack by a number of countries around the world today. Even on topics that you would think inconceivable that to be the case. Last March in New York, I had to fly in order to join the debate that had broken out at the Commission for the Status of Women, that's a new UN organ that deals with women's rights, where the topic was violence against women, and where there was a danger not to have joint conclusions agreed by everyone, because some countries were trying to insert cultural relativism and family values and traditional values notions in the fundamental topic, which is you cannot beat women up. And eventually that attack was averted. We did manage to get the right coalitions of countries, but you can see from that the remarkable danger and the unseemly nature that this attack is taking. And this attack is based on a fundamental misconception, in some cases um, intentionally cultivated, by some governments who simply don't like human rights and like to have an excuse to violate them. In other cases, not intentionally uh, cultivated. I have to be honest about this. There is, in many cases, even among well-meaning people around the world, a developing narrative that human rights were somehow uh, a concoction of the West imposed upon the rest. That somehow, Human rights as we all know them and their universality are based on some cultural understanding that existed in the West a few decades ago, and that in order for other countries to apply the same rights equally, there has to be an equivalent cultural understanding that develops in those countries as well, and that may take you know, years or decades or centuries. And the fallacy with this argument is that indeed and in fact human rights has never been a battle between different cultures, a battle between different religions, a battle between different political systems, or between different countries. Never. 
ever been that. Human rights has always been, from their inception, the universal language of the powerless in any country, in any religion, in any society, in any culture, against the cultural relativism of the powerful. A woman being beaten up in Athens or in Washington DC or in Moscow or in Beijing or in Mexico City will probably never come and tell you, please do not intervene on my behalf. Let me be beaten up because human rights are not universal. She's the powerless. The husband doing the beating will most likely tell you, you have no right to intervene. You don't understand. We have special family values in this country. Here's the powerful. A journalist being arrested or thrown in jail or killed for what he or she writes will probably never tell you, you cannot intervene on my behalf because human rights are not universal. And he or she is the powerless. And the police or the government doing the imprisoning or the killing, they will always tell you that you don't get it, that there are special uh, security reasons that uh, require or justify the imprisonment or the killing. They are the powerful. Human rights are the universal language of the powerless against the relativism of the powerful. Second umbrella challenge that we face is civil society and the attack on civil society and civil society space around the world. We see that increasingly in many countries and it takes many different dangerous forms. In the worst case scenario you have people indeed killed or imprisoned and by the by some of the killings against human rights defenders do not take place by police or by governments, but they may even take place by private companies who are investing in places around the world and they don't want to have people complaining about those investments. But that, if you like, is the extreme. You have a huge and very um, imaginative gradation of, hum of human rights violations against civil society and human rights defenders. In some cases, people are not allowed to be funded and funded by other people abroad, although international human rights law says that civil society should be able to get funds from anywhere. And lacking domestic funding because a country is extremely poor or because a government intimidates anyone domestically who funds civil society, then the organizations are in danger of dying. In other cases, related to funding or not, there are labels placed in civil society. Foreign agents, spies of the West or of the East or of the this or of the that, depending on who the particular you know, devised or real enemy of any particular government is at the time. And that is creating an extremely dangerous environment for civil society to operate under. Because it stigmatizes people. In other cases, there are laws that don't allow civil society to register. And NGOs are trying to register and they can't. And then they are being persecuted by, for being illegal. There are many, many, many gradations. Why is that a problem? I submit to you it's a problem for, for the obvious reasons you can imagine when it comes to the right of people to speak freely and to assemble freely, which are major human rights, but for another reason as well. Human rights will not and cannot be imposed by the outside. If human rights is to take root really in any country, it has to become the ownership of the people and eventually the governments of those countries. We can and must and are present in many difficult countries and situations. We can and must and do engage with governments, support civil society, try to change bad trends to the better, but in the end of the day, it is the ability of a society itself to embrace human rights that will ensure that human rights will prosper, and therefore that the society will prosper. But that means civil society has to be free to function, because without a civil society, it is impossible for any country to take hold and to make its own ownership of human rights. So when there are people, governments, others attacking civil society, they are in a sense attacking the chance for human rights to take hold. 
That's why it's important to support civil society. And we are doing it in many ways, and I'll be glad to answer how if anyone is interested in more details, but I don't want to take much more time. Third umbrella challenge, economic, social, cultural rights. What is that? That's human rights, according to whom? According to international conventions signed by everyone. Okay, what do they entail? Things like fighting poverty, things like education for everyone, things like health care for everyone, um, things like, it also connects to freedom of association, uh, labor laws and labor standards uh, in different countries and different companies. Okay, why is that an important challenge? The answer is because in many countries in the world that you will visit and you will talk about human rights, you will get the following. Thank you very much. We understand the importance of freedom on the internet. We get it. Only 10% of, of our people have the internet right now, so thank you. But, you know, a huge number don't have food on the table and don't have shelter over their heads. What is the European Union doing about those human rights? Or what is the United States doing about those human rights? And that is a very important, a very important challenge for us because our credibility in promoting all human rights, because that's what the universality of rights means, among other things, an equal emphasis on every right, depends on ensuring that we focus on those rights as well. Okay? Is Europe not doing enough for economic, social, cultural rights around the world? Is it fair to criticize it that it only talks about civil and political rights? Answer, absolutely unfair to criticize it for that. Why? Well, about 55% of all development aid today given to virtually every country around the world is European Union and its member states' money. 55%. Europe is 10% of the world's population, about 20% of the world's economic power, 55% of the world's development aid. That says a lot. Do we call that aid human rights aid when it builds schools, when it allows women to go to school and to be empowered both in economic life and in political life? Because, of course, economic and social rights are directly related to civil and political ones. Do we call it human rights when we build hospitals? Do we call it human rights when we build wells for water in places that doesn't exist? Answer, no, we don't. Why? I don't know. I can guess, and I'm guessing that the reason is that we never called it human rights when we did it in Europe. So, interestingly, when we built our free health and our free education systems throughout Europe, the Europe and European member states, when we built social safety nets and retirement funds for all our people, we never thought of it as fulfilling our human rights obligations. We called it as a social responsibility that we have to do or something like that. We never called it human rights. And I guess because of that, when we do it abroad, we don't call it human rights either. We should. It is, if it is done, done correctly. Is it always done correctly? No. That's a challenge. So how it is that we in Europe and you in the United States ensure that there's a human rights um, analysis of our development aid, making sure that what we spend around the world does reach everyone equally and does make a real change in the people's lives, that's key. Now, fourth and final challenge. There are more, but I'll just... Um, our coherence, what I told you at the beginning. There are three types of coherence challenges I submit to you that anyone in my job uh, face. And uh, have to be addressed because being coherent means that you're credible to those you speak to. Being credible for a union such as the European Union is your real weapon. It is your soft power. We don't go around the world with guns telling people what to do. It's not our style, if you like. But people do listen and do respect the European Union when it talks human rights, especially when they feel that we are coherent. What are the three challenges? 
First challenge, internal-external coherence. Second challenge, external-external coherence. Third challenge, internal-internal coherence. What is internal-external? The obvious challenge, isn't it? Are we practicing what we preach? Are we addressing human rights challenges within our countries in the same way that we expect others to address their challenges? Europe is facing today human rights challenges. There is a rise in racism. There is a rise in xenophobia. There is a rise in some cases on, in, on violence based on those things. Uh, we do face an immigration challenge and how we de deal with immigrants' rights and asylum seekers, seekers' rights. These are serious human rights challenges. Some countries point to them when I speak to them and say, why are you telling me about the people I've thrown in jail and the activists that are dead and the journalists that are not allowed to speak? Look at you. My answer to that is very simple. No one, no one in the world is perfect in human rights. No one. And if anyone goes around the world pretending that they are, uh, shame on them. It's just not true. But the fact that we're not all perfect does not mean that we're all, we're all equally imperfect. The important thing is to have in place, as we do in Europe, the right instruments that do not allow us to shove our imperfections under the carpet. To have in place the right institutions that force us to uh, try to be perfect. To have a free press that can reveal human rights violations without journalists being silenced. To have a free and open internet where people can blog and discuss. To have freely elected parliaments where parliamentarians can actually raise those issues. To interact with a free civil society and NGO community with which we may not agree all the time. Many times we may disagree, but we do not silence, we do not persecute, we do not call names, we do not jail, we talk to. Because all those mechanisms keep you honest. To have independent ombudspeople in each member state that monitors the human rights situation in our member states. No one is perfect, absolutely not, but we have to ensure that at least everyone has the mechanisms in place to deal with their imperfections. And many countries around the world don't. So my basic and fundamental plea to them and my effort with them is to ensure that they put those mechanisms in place. Internal, I'm sorry, external, external coherence. What does that mean? That means when a country that is friendly to us violates human rights, are we equally vigilant and critical than when a country that is not friendly to us violates human rights? That is a second challenge. It's an important one. Because again, it could affect your soft power, your credibility in promoting human rights around the world. We can discuss in the question of answers, if you like, particular examples or, or situations. But I will tell you this, just as a general matter. Is this a challenge? Absolutely. On the whole, do realistic considerations take precedent over human rights considerations? Absolutely not. Human rights matters in virtually every country that the European Union has relations. Is that obvious to the outside neutral observer? No. Why? Because you don't always use the same kind of language or the same kind of tools to raise human rights violations in different countries. It really does depend a lot on how you feel you can be most effective in ensuring that those violations are mitigated. In some cases, you may feel that you have to be more vocal. In other cases, you may judge that quiet diplomacy is more potentially effective. There's no magic formula for this. I mean, this is what hardcore diplomacy and politics have to make as decisions every day. But the fact of the matter is there's virtually no country around the world, friendly or not friendly to the European Union, that is not 
constantly exposed at all levels of interaction to a discussion on human rights, including concerns that we may have, but also including any support we may be able to give as a EU to make the situation better. My desire is not to make a point, is to make a difference. That's the EU's desire. Our desire is not simply to point fingers, is also to join hands, if there is a possibility to achieve that. And it is that commitment and consistency in promoting human rights with everyone, friend and foe, and at the same time desire to be credible in an interaction where they may decide to work with us, it is that balance, a difficult balance that, in my view, in our view, should be the goal of a human rights foreign policy. Third consistency challenge, internal, internal. That means basically, does everyone in your own house understand and speak of human rights in the same way? Or does the human rights guy go and speak human rights and then the trade guy goes and says, okay, you met the human rights guy, nice guy, now let's talk money. That is a challenge. And it is not a challenge because of anyone's ill will or attitudes towards human rights. It's because as difficult as it was, so I can close perhaps with how I began, to have that strategic framework of human rights that the 27 at the time member states agreed to unanimously. As difficult as that was to set those, the, the bar so high, it is, as you can imagine, even tougher to make the necessary changes internally in our own hearts and minds, forget everyone else's, to ensure that we can do human rights correctly. That takes time. If you were to think of Europe, the institutions, the European Council, 28 member states with separate their own foreign policies and human rights policies, the European Commission, with a number of commissioners dealing with human rights, the External Action Service, the foreign ministry, let's say, of the EU, with its own human rights people and department, but also its geographic desks, who are looking at particular countries and may not be immediately automatically incorporating human rights concerns when we'll look at that. The European Parliament, a major EU institution, ensuring that coherence is challenging, tough, but absolutely necessary. In the past year and a half, I submit to you that in all these challenges I mentioned abroad, the umbrella challenges, the universality challenge, the civil society space challenge, the economic social rights challenge, the coherence challenge, that we have made a huge leap forward. And we have done this joining hands with the United Nations, with the Council of Europe, with the OSCE, in which the United States is also a remarkably active member, with the United States itself, and my visit here indicates that, if you like. In other words, our goal is not to pretend or to simply try to stamp Europe as a leading human rights player around the world. That is not Europe's interest. Frankly, deep down, it shouldn't be. The question is, can you build up the correct alliances? Can you yourself do right, but inspire others to do as well? Can you create a collective punch that much exceeds your own and make a difference to people's lives on the ground? I hope that we will be able to achieve more of that as the years go by. And I very much look forward to your questions and comments as to whether or not, in your view, uh, we can do it better. Thank you very much. Thank you again to the Thank Wilson you. Center for this invitation. Well, thank you. That was a very uh, passionate and incisive message, and I particularly liked your phrase about pointing fingers and joining hands, which I think is a very nice way to describe the role. Um, we have, I think, because uh, we started a little late, maybe about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I had a question, but in fact, I think I will, I will yield to others from the floor. I know that there will be many questions. We have microphones. Please wait for the microphone. Identify yourself when you make a comment. And first to the lady in the middle there, please. Hi, my name is Barbara Dello. 
To me, it seems we have before us two large unspoken issues. Um, one of sovereignty versus political globalization, and one of human rights assistance versus forced redistribution. Could you comment about the political dynamics of these issues both within the EU and across the Atlantic, and to what degree is human rights and the will to provide human rights around the world being used to further this other agenda? Can you, can, you, uh, can you tell me the second thing? I got the so sovereignty versus globalization. The second one was? Human rights assistance versus forced redistribution. Uh, I guess the economic aspects you were talking about. Yeah, but I mean, what is forced redistribution? Uh, shall, shall we just... You, to you go ahead, yeah. Okay. The, Thank you. The, the sovereignty versus the globalization of political power uh, debate is indeed one that you hear uh, brought up uh, by a number of countries uh, when they don't like um, uh, what they hear from us and others on the human rights record. But in fact, it's an issue that has been resolved a long time ago with unanimous decisions of uh, many countries, including those. Um, human rights are standards with which, uh, under which we have all agreed uh, to, uh, to be judged. Uh, in the United Nations, the Universal Periodic Review is, is an example where we abandon our sovereignty, uh, or if you like, we, we place our sovereignty and uh, the actions of our countries under the review, uh, criticism, and suggestions of others. And there are many cases, both multilaterally and regionally, that we, that we have made those decisions. Uh, not to mention, of course, situations in which with uh, Security Council approval you can have actually a humanitarian intervention, including military intervention. So uh, it is, if you like, a uh, again, one of those fake uh, or false, in my view, um, um, uh, you know, dilemmas that, that are being pushed uh, by people when they don't like being scrutinized. Uh, but uh, it's been resolved a, a long time ago, and indeed that is the whole philosophy of human rights. Human rights focus on human beings. They spring from the dignity of, of every human being. What does that mean? That means that they don't look at countries or boundaries. That was, again, a collective decision of everyone around the world. We said that, you know, we are not going to be saying that if you live in a particular country, then it's okay to be killed or beaten up because they are, you know, you, th that is the country. We said that, no, we're not going to look at human rights as a country right. It's not the right of a country, it's not a right of a religion to be protected, it's a right of a human being within a religion, of a human being within a country. And in that sense, we have decided when discussing human rights, and rightfully so, to uh, expand the uh, ability of each one of us to look not just at our faults, but at others. I'm not sure I understand the second uh, debate, the human rights assistance versus forced redistribution. I'm not sure what that means, honestly. The human rights assistance in many cases, a humanitarian assistance, if you like, is something that we obviously give uh, in major crisis situations, um, and uh, Syria and Mali and the Central African Republic and other situations are, are those today. That is the kind of humanitarian aid that you give to people who are being killed or displaced or dying. There's no, uh, obviously, issue of uh, redistribution of, uh, of, um, of forced redistribution of welfare that I can see. Um, I would say, however, in terms of the distribution of wealth, that that is a very interesting point when it comes to looking at countries' records, countries that will tell you sometimes that I am very effective, perhaps not at civil and political rights, but I'm doing very well at economic and social rights. Look at me. I have uh, taken so many million of people out of poverty the past uh, year. Look at me. I have created so many more jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very important and interesting in those countries to always examine whether or not at the same time that these positive steps are happening, there's a very negative step happening at the same time, which is that this newly created wealth is being distributed very unevenly. And you see in many of those countries that what is called the Gini coefficient, it's the way that you actually measure that kind of uh, income distribution, distribution, is worse than in any other country. In other words, you're creating new wealth, but at the same time, you're creating new, uh, new major inequalities between the few who collect the majority of it and the very, very vast majority who has little. And that could be potentially a source of major social unrest that could 
ruin any economic and social human rights achievements you've, you've made. So, um, you know, everything interacts there, and, and I think that that's an important thing for us to point out. Down at the front here on the right, please. Thank you very much. My name is Agron Adibadi. Do you, Mr. Lambrinidis, do you have a set date where, when the European Union will ratify or join the European Convention for Human Rights? And how do you reconcile this shortcoming with the very ambitious uh, uh, coherence or credibility agenda that you so eloquently presented here? Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I hope, we all hope this date will be very soon. Uh, in fact, th there were long negotiations because the Council of Europe, as you know, is not just European member states, as there are many other countries. Uh, European countries that are not European member states. There were long negotiations uh, in order to be able to establish um, how the EU would join. You know, there are a number of issues. It's the first collective of countries that would join as a member. So there were issues that came out, you know, the, the, the vote of the, the, the weight of the votes of different member states. Does the EU vote and then all the member states vote or not? Uh, you know, how does the EU get judged on its human rights record? Who determines what competences a EU competence was not? How the European Court of Human Rights come in? Anyway, happily, all these negotiations were successfully completed a few months ago. So there's an absolute agreement today between the European Union and the Council of Europe on that set, on, on, the, uh, on the accession. Now, that agreement has to also be examined by the European Court. So it's there. I, don't, I, I really cannot tell you exactly when that uh, judicial decision will be completed. But like I said, I hope very, very shortly. I am, um, I, I would be proud to be able to join as European Union, the, the Council of Europe and the European Convention, which is not to say, of course, that the fact that we're not there at this stage uh, means that we're not applying uh, all its human rights provisions and more. Uh, but it, it would be important, nevertheless, to be an official member. It's a good question. A uh, question down here on the left, at the front. Meto Koloski, former Woodrow Wilson Center employee um, and uh, of Macedonian heritage, but I'm not going to ask anything uh, on the Macedonian minority in Greece, but I do want to uh, ask you regarding the current case against the Greek Helsinki Monitor um, spokesperson, Painayoti Dimitras, who's facing uh, charges of perjury and defamation in regards to an attorney who wrote a book um, that was very anti-Semitic and uh, glorified Hitler, and I think the book was called "The Jews, uh, the Whole Truth," and uh, and and called for the extermination of Jews. And I think this was during the time of when you were foreign minister. Uh, the courts uh, acquitted uh, this uh, attorney, and uh, the World Organization for Torture recently called on the Greek Prime Minister to uh, intervene on this matter. Do you have any comments? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I would if I if I if I remembered or could, or could recollect all the details of this case. I'll be glad to uh, to look into it. Uh, interestingly, by the way, because this is, there is an interesting issue. Interestingly, uh, you always have um, anecdotal examples that are brought out by people about Europe. Uh, you raised one case about Greece suddenly that you know most people don't know about, and I don't know all the details. And you may actually have it right, or maybe you may have it wrong. But that is not the whole picture, and people focus on their own thing. And you could get similar things for Germany, for France, etc. I think that every case is very important to look at. I'm not minimizing anyone. But, you know, interestingly, I got, like I said before, uh, in many European countries, you do have, in some cases, human rights challenges, and others not. The question is, do you have a system that allows you to be able to address them, in other words, that doesn't uh, force you to uh, not. And I am, in that sense, very pleased when people raise specific questions for European Union member states. Uh, but I always try to also point them to the bigger picture. But thank you for the question. So here's another question here in the left-hand side. Thank you very much. It's Matthew Hale from the Lifeline Fund, which is an embattled civil society fund. Uh, it's a coalition between uh, human rights organisations and uh, 17 governments, including European Union countries. Um, you mentioned uh, about the EU as being a leader of development. I just wanted to ask you specifically on civil society space, um, what safeguards and measures can be inserted into the post-2015 development goals that can assist civil society space? Uh, and secondly, 
Could you comment a little bit on Ethiopia? I think Ethiopia is one of the countries where uh, its advancement in terms of development has overshadowed its human rights record. And there's been a bit of silence uh, from, uh, uh, from many countries on its human rights record because it's doing so well in terms of development. Yeah, uh, well, let me assure you on the Ethiopia that that is not the case in our case. In other words, the human rights challenges, they are very serious and we communicate them um, uh, very often. And there is also an issue there, particularly with uh, civil society and, and, uh, and the restrictions on supporting civil society. Uh, there, is, uh, there, there are issues... Uh, and, uh, I don't want to get in particular countries. I mean, every country has challenges. I'd much rather talk about ours, although it's not on my job. In fact, I'm explicitly not assigned to monitor EU member states or to comment on them. But it's just, as I mentioned, the coherence challenges, in many cases, people bring those issues up to me. Um, the uh, post-2015 uh, development in civil society is, is, a, is a very interesting challenge. Um, Europe has the largest dedicated fund in the world uh, dedicated to supporting civil society and human rights defenders. It's called the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights. And uh, it has, uh, you know, uh, over a billion uh, euros uh, in the past uh, few years uh, allocated to it. And that supports anything from capacity building to, uh, you know, people being, um, uh, you know, attacked, uh, having to defend themselves in trial but having no money for lawyers to uh, funding specific projects all over the world uh, that would promote uh, human rights and development and development. Many civil society organizations are not civil political rights organizations per se, they are development organizations. Uh, and even in those countries who don't particularly like civil political rights, uh, the, the, uh, the importance, the value of NGOs uh, can perhaps be more easily underscored uh, so that everyone can be supported uh, when, uh, when they also understand that we support economic social rights NGOs. The post-2015 discussion is an important one. And I had the chance to also engage in it now in my, in my uh, Washington contacts. In a nutshell, uh, no one has exactly decided yet what they will be uh, in, in all details promoting. So I don't think that in a public forum it's, it's the right place to, to, to get too many details. But I will tell you that everyone in the European Union unanimously and in the United Nations system as well believe that human rights, uh, and that includes well, that human rights have to be at the center of the post-2015 development goals. Now, what does that mean in practice when you're actually deciding a development program in a particular country? It means that you cannot ignore civil society on the ground when you plan the program. You cannot ignore civil society, the people who will be directly affected, in other words, by this program, when you implement the program. And you cannot ignore civil society when you evaluate the program. So there are three stages in this business where in the past and in the previous development goals there was a sense that governments could somehow decide without the engagement of anyone on the ground being affected, you know, what they're going to build, how they're going to build it, and who they're going to involve in it. However, making sure that whatever you do actually spreads the wealth and the support to everyone equally, men and women, uh, poor and not so poor, um, is a fundamental challenge. And in many ways, whether or not you're doing good human rights policy with development or bad depends on addressing this challenge. And that means engaging civil society. I think we've got time for two more questions. There was one at the back on the left there. And then I'll take one more after that. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Johanna Surpa. I work for the Nordic Trust Fund of the World Bank. I appreciated how you described the need to mainstream human rights into the various pro policies and programs of the EU and also how you described the various coherence challenges that the EU faces. Uh, to make it a bit more concrete though, I wanted to mention uh, the case of Uganda and its recent LGBT law, and maybe if you could just describe what kind of tools the EU has to react and, and influence an ongoing situation like this, and how it can use them in a coherent manner. Thank you. Thank you. We've been very active on the, on the Uganda front, and not just. There are a number of African countries, unfortunately, that, that are dealing with, uh, with these laws. Uh, they deeply trouble me, and they deeply trouble the EU. 
We have made uh, private uh, demarches to governments and parliaments. We have made public statements. Uh, uh, the American president, President Obama, a few days back, made a public statement, an appeal to the Ugandan president not to sign the law. Uh, the president went, went ahead and signed the law nevertheless. And what troubled me uh, was, again, how this fake um, uh, traditional values, cultural relativism argument was used uh, to justify such a horrifically, uh, such an abhorrent uh, piece of legislation. So the basic statement was, uh, well, you know, you have your culture back in the West. You are depraved people, obviously. We don't criticize you if you want to live like depraved people. Uh, you know, don't criticize us with our culture when we want to live like virtuous people. It is a scandal because no one is creating, no one is creating special rights for gays and lesbians around the world when they talk about LGBTI rights. The only thing that we are saying and every civilized person around the world should be saying is that the exact same human rights that apply to me if I'm black, or if I'm white, or if I'm a woman or a man, or if I am disabled or not disabled, or if I believe in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, Allah, if I believe in uh, Jesus, the exact same rights should apply to me if I'm gay and if I'm not. No new rights, no more rights, no less rights. And if we decide that it is okay in every different country to carve out categories of people that we can beat up and allow to be killed just because we happen not to like them. So in a particular country, we don't like the blacks. It's okay, we defend human rights, let the blacks die. In another country, we don't like the Muslims. It's okay, we defend human rights, women and men are okay, the Muslims die. That is an, the recipe for ruining human rights around the world. It is a scandal that that language is being used when it comes to gay rights. The pretension that the West is trying to impose its lifestyle, that is absolute baloney. All that we are saying is that the exact same right everyone has, gays and lesbians and transsexuals and intersex people also should have. No more, no less. And you know what? The moment you start opening up the door to those exceptions, you may find that door opening up in your face one day. Because you never know, do you? You never know. You feel safe today, and you never know if tomorrow you will not be the minority that is going to be persecuted in any particular country. In any particular country. So it's absolutely ridiculous and, and, and deeply offensive uh, to me that this debate is happening the way that uh, in, some, in some countries it's, it's, it's happening. I should say one last question. Um, somebody at the back there, right at the back in the middle. Thank you very much uh, for your time. I'm Yane Bojewski, journalist from Voice of America, Macedonian service. Uh, Mr. Wombridis, I have one question. Can you tell me about the short, short assessment of the human rights practices in Macedonia? And the second part of the question is for their neighboring countries, for Greece, that the last year country reports on the human rights practices of the State Department stated that the government in Athens did not uh, recognize the existence of the Slavic dialect uh, called Macedonia by its speakers. Nevertheless, that a small number of its speakers identified themselves as Macedonians. What will be your comment, please? Thank you. Well, like I said before, there's always some people that come up with particular questions for every European country, and I think that's a very respectable thing to do uh, if you're concerned. Uh, about those issues. Uh, I will not comment for obvious reasons and, uh, and also because, if you like, it's not, as I told you, my job to be commenting on those things. Uh, but you can, you can assume that I disagree with your, uh, with your uh, uh, assertions and, uh, and analyses. And you can also be assured that I insist, uh, and, I, uh, and I have to, although it's not my job, and I mentioned this in our coherence arguments, that, uh, that every European country has to look at uh, different uh, human rights challenges, uh, both outside of Europe and inside. Very good. Well, thank you very much indeed. Stavros Lambranidis, thank you so much for visiting us here today. And, and I, I, noticed, I noticed no one asked about the NSA. <laughs> no one asked. What are you? Are you, are you, are you too polite? <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> 
Okay. It's a very interesting.